so great to be here. I'm, I've been really looking forward to this conversation uh, today with our panelists and all of you. The way that this is going to work is that I've got a few questions and we're going to have a conversation here for probably the first um, 25 to 30 minutes. And then we will also open it up at that point for some other questions from some of you. And I wondered if to start with um, um, Amy, Sally, and Jamie, if maybe you would just kind of let us know the last online course that you taught or and or um, what you are teaching specifically this semester, just so that we kind of understand where you are uh, currently. So I'll start with Amy right now. Yes, um, I taught over the summer my class 480 on the fairy tale and my class 339 fantasies to cyberspace on the history of children's and young adult lit. And I'm teaching the same two classes right now asynchronously. All right, that's great. And Sally? Um, in the spring, I taught uh, professional and technical writing um, online. And um, I'm teaching one section of that again this semester, fully asynchronously, fully online. And then I have an in-person class this semester, too, on detective stories. That's great. It's awesome. All of these so far all sound fun. Uh, Jamie? Um, I've been pretty much teaching, teaching continuously online um, since 2020. Um, all of our classes went online online see in various formats in 2020 and then since then we've continued um, writing for careers in industry and academia that's offered both in person and online asynchronously and um, public strategies for communicating with global sectors that's offered twice asynchronously both in the fall and in spring it's also offered in person excellent well that's great well I'm going to, you know, sometimes interviewers will uh, wait a little longer in the interview process to kind of do the little little devil's advocate here. But I'm going to start off with this, which is, okay, you're teaching online. Today we're talking about engagement. This is really our overall um, conversation. We're going to get in talking a little bit about kind of how we enhance student engagement with with the structure we're going to talk about technology and tools and then talk about some teaching strategies. So that's kind of our structure here today to talk about. But right off the top, is student engagement online really that important? Like, you know, don't you, when you're teaching online, it's basically just you're going to put a bunch of content there for people to access, like a, like some sort of digital te textbook that that students access, and you just kind of go back to bed or whatever else you do as as faculty when you're teaching online. Uh, I don't know who wants to respond to that first. I will jump in with a student comment I got, I think it was last fall from an online course. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah, okay, great. Um, uh, it was a fully distance ed student because it was in that section, but it was anonymous, so I don't know which which one it was, but um, this student um, said of of my course, which has group work, and um, I communicate with them regularly, um, and I trouble have to troubleshoot technology and group problems a lot, so I'm there. So this student said, I actually feel like I got my money's worth out of this class <laughs> and I feel like I learned and, and I know I learned something. I mean, he just says, I really learned something in this class and I really feel like it wasn't just a blow off online class and that I got my money's worth for this. I mean, he used the phrase, got my money's worth. So I think that it just even perception wise and this student felt more engaged um, and felt that it made the class worthwhile. So I guess I'll jump in and say it depends. I mean, I guess from pers I think, okay, I'll start off with this, um, I think, commonly held assumption that if people are not in person, physically there, so um, in a physical classroom, I know that someone is there, 
they at least have spent the time to come to class and sit and be in the room. Some people are in the room, but not of the room, but at least they're in the room. Um, and therefore we take that as a metric for learning in, as, a, as, a, as a, like a physical presence metric, I guess, and think, well, I can't do that online. So I have to somehow create a way that that can be metric or measured. And I don't know, I think that that is good. It is good to, to embrace ways that you can stimulate online learning that is engaged. I don't necessarily know that it is necessary for everyone to be, for screen time, to be a, a re replicant for physical in-person. I'll give it from my, my own personal experience. To get through my learning process, did I need to be engaged? I don't know. Sometimes was I engaged? Yes, if I was interested. But if someone forced me to be, like stare at the screen for a certain amount of time, because I know that you're gonna be there, I don't necessarily know that that would have made my learning process better. So I guess it's the way that you approach it is that if it's beneficial for the student to be engaged, to learn what they need to learn, then yes. I think that if it's just, we need to find a way to force people to be on their screen as a metric to say that they were there, I don't necessarily know if that's beneficial. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and um, really our goal here is learning, right? Our goal here is not engagement as much as engagement uh, might be important for learning and developing a learning community. But our goal here really is learning. Amy, what do you think? Is engagement my, important? Yes, I think it does depend, though. In my case, engagement is probably the most important aspect of my classes. And my students consistently say that they're so engaged in the classes that they the classes remind them of being in the first grade or the third grade where they had revelations in class that have changed their lives completely. And they feel that they've spent thousands of dollars on this class. They want the same kind of engagement that they get face to face. And in my asynchronous classes, they're able to have that degree of engagement, if not even more. So I'm, I think my classes very much promote engagement. That's just the style in which I teach. Yeah, that's great. Well, as we're thinking about these different areas of engagement, and as I said, we kind of split them up in terms of uh, this kind of structural or development aspect of the online class. And we're also going to talk about technology and, and teaching. Um, Sally, what would you say in terms of this kind of in the structural development area? How do you plan engagement into your into your course, into your online course? Um, I know one thing I do, and this I think kind of gets to uh, what what Jamie was talking about about making sure that they're in the classroom. But I mean, students just being present does not equate engaged <laughs> at all. I mean, I've been plenty of in-person classes with students there, but not engaged. But um, I do try to minimize the amount of clicks they have to do outside of Canvas. Um, I, I just, for me and for the way I think my classes work, if I can put most of my stuff in Canvas, um, because that's the, the LMS we use, it just make it as easy for them to get through so that they don't have the technology to distract them is, is one way I do it. I mean, that's just kind of my plan. It's like, if I can get something that integrates with canvas pretty seamlessly, I'll use it. Um, just to keep them uh, moving through the course, um, rather than having to click out and, and find a whole bunch of different um, things. So that's kind of one of my plans as I plan it. Um, uh, another, another thing that I do is um, I embed quizzes in my lectures. And so this is a little bit more like in the classroom engagement or eye contact. It's just touch points where they have to answer a question in order to move forward in the lecture. And uh, I've gotten feedback from students that it helps them focus on the things that, that I really want them to know. Um, and honestly, they may be watching the lectures at double speed. Um, 
I know I watch a lot of things at one and a half, two times speed, not Amy's stuff though, because she talks fast anyway, <laughs> but, um, but I do watch um, a lot of stuff fast and, and, and get the information. So it's, I don't mind them watching it fast, but I do want them to pause at certain points and um, recognize certain concepts. So that's, that's another um sort of another way that I kind of help them to engage with the content. And again, that's not really me. I mean, I'm really trying to just get them to look at the content and understand the content. Um, I also do group work. And because of the courses that I teach, which are a lot of uh, very heavy in writing and communication, um, I do try to get them to work with each other. That is one of the learning outcomes of my courses is uh, collaboration online, virtual collaboration on documents, at least my writing courses. So I start that early and then I keep them in the same group all, all um, semester uh, to do peer review. So they have a project early and then throughout the semester, they stay in that group to do those peer reviews of each other's writings so that they kind of get to know each other and feel much more comfortable. And um, let's see, uh, other things that I actually plan in advance. Um, I do do discussions. I know that some people, there's like a love-hate relationships with discussions. But in some of the discussions, I... I try to um, have them be per like more personal, like, hey, you know, what what are some examples of some really bad emails you've gotten, <laughs> you know, or some really good emails you've gotten, or, um, you know, what, what are some really bad presentations you've seen or that you've done in the past? So that's more personal and it kind of gets them feeling more comfortable in the discussions. But then I also use other discussions to get them to connect with the material. So the goal of the discussion in some cases isn't for them to connect with each other, but to connect with the content and engage with the content and really analyze it, which works a little better than in class because they all have to do it. Uh, well, I guess they don't have to, they could, you know, get an zero, but um, it's all part of their grades. Whereas in class discussions, often it's, they don't have to, they don't contribute. So here, at least all of them are somewhat connecting to the content. Um, I do use also Zoom Teams chat, which is, uh, I don't want to use GroupMe um, just because I don't need to get on group me for other stuff <laughs> and I don't want to ask students to do it if they don't have it and I, most of them have zooms or all of them have access to zooms through UT it's supported by UT so I, I create those for their group projects and I create one for the class um, and that's a much more casual and easier way to to connect and I I throw out bonus points on that. I, you know, hey, first one to answer, you know, what the grammar error in this sign I saw was or something to to just try and get them to sort of engage with it. Um, well, yeah, in, engage with it on a little a lighter, uh, less intense note, just so that they can be thinking about, hey, these are things that we see in the world that are out there, not just here in the classroom. So, mm -hmm. so those are some of the main, main, like, Plan things that I plan out ahead of class period of what I'm going to do in yeah. order to try and keep the students engaged through the semester. That's good. Um, I had a bunch of thoughts. One uh, clarifying. So the Zoom's chat is outside of, because some people may not even be realize mm -hmm. or even realize that this is possible, but outside of synchronous meetings, you can still chat with people like instant messenger through Zoom if they've got it up. Yes, yes, it is. It's it's you can't do it through the web. You have to have the app, whether mm -hmm. it's on the desktop or the phone, I guess, or a tablet. Um, but but with the app, you can use it just like an instant messaging, like a group me. It's not or it's not as robust as Discord or Group Me or Slack. It doesn't have you can't do a lot of sub channels. But um, it's something that all the students have access to. It's supported by UT. And so it's not going to open them to some other privacy concerns. And, and so that's that's one of the reasons I like to use it rather than some of those other channels. That's great. And I may come back to some, because uh, I've 
got questions for all of you, maybe in terms of success stories, but I might move on then. We're talking about technology, but before that, also made me think of if people aren't familiar with the community of inquiry, we talk about that a fair bit in our team in terms of um, this idea of within your course, connecting, making sure students are connecting with the content, with the teacher and with each other. And it really could be almost used as this idea of um, uh, engagement in each of those things. So you're talking about engagement with the content and and so on so if if people haven't looked into that but um but that's good and I, I love that idea of keeping people in canvas so that they're not disengaging so part of engagement is is trying to funnel them a little bit so they're not disengaging getting getting tripped up by the technology or whatever in different ways so i, I love those ideas yeah um I'm going to move on to Jamie and ask uh, uh, Jamie, as Sally had talked a little bit about Zoom here, what tools, technology tools, because I know that you're really um, into the technology a little bit, um, what technology tools have you found helpful to really increase engagement in your in your classes? Um. Yeah, so I guess I kind of broke them down into different categories. So first, um, AI tools. So um, I have used AI actually both uh, in person and online. And so um, in both of my classes that are asynchronous, uh, we have discussion forums and um, I've been using a platform called Packback for um, those. For the past couple semesters and they're kind of neat because they provide students as inside the platform with like feedback as they are writing so it's either when they're writing a question or a response it'll make suggestions to um you know improve the openness of their question or to include a reference as a citation if they state a fact so it's kind of doing a little bit of prompting as well as um, some grammar and mechanics um, suggestions. Uh, ultimately, when it comes to me, I have a I can go in and correct what AI said, said or or make my own comments, but it kind of gives the students a, a tool as they were doing it. And and this semester, um, I, they kind of updated it. So there's another version of Packback on the same platform called Deep Dives. And it's a writing tool and again it will provide feedback to the students as they are writing but this year they've introduced a chat bot and so it's a little bit different from chat gpt in that it will not produce content the students can't ask it to write for them but they can ask it questions like i'm stuck here and i don't know what to write next can you give can you get help me generate ideas and so then it will kind of guide them through that thought process or they might ask I've been asked to write an essay on this topic and I don't know how to structure it. Could you give me some examples of structure? And so then it will kind of guide them through thinking through the, where to get started and structured. So that's like a writing assistant. Um, can I ask Jamie, so, uh, what can you tell when students access that chat bot? Like I, I'm just kind of curious from a teaching standpoint, like uh, if you can tell any kind of engagement with that i have not yet looked to see if um they'll generate a report based on if students have interacted with the, with the chatbot or not but i guess i could do some uh post test uh survey to ask them whether about their chatbot use and we've done some research this semester on um packback we mainly looked at user interface uh questions but yeah that's a really good idea um, and then with ChatGPT or UTverse is the UT own one. I've kind of used that in class, both online and in person, as an ideation tool. So if they're doing group work, they might um, interact with ChatGPT and ask them to provide suggestions for their group work. Or if they are, I have a negotiation part section of a class where they have to negotiate with other teams, and I kind of get them to work with ChatGPT to evaluate their negotiation skills. So they 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 write up their strategy and they ask ChatGPT to provide them suggestions based on that. So it's kind of like in both circumstances.
sense is they're using AI as like a feedback tool and assistant. So I, I guess that's what I'm trying to move away from is the, the crutch of, well, I'm going to use this just to generate content to, I'm going to work alongside this as a tool to help me. Um, and so that's, that's in, the, in the AI field. And then for courseware, um, I kind of, I really like the interactive uh, textbook formats. So I've used both Pearson Ravel and MyLab. So these are kind of two different Pearson products and they're both either they come with quizzes or simulations or video content that people can accompany the, the book or the chapter is literally broken up with, okay, you've read this section. Now here's a writing, write your thoughts out or we're going to quiz you on the past on the thing. It kind of keeps breaks the chapter up into kind of little pieces of engagement that they do. Um, in terms of developing content, uh, instructors in our department have been using a platform called Nearpod. And so this is a um, kind of a lesson building tool that uh, you can put in slides, but then you can also insert into your slides interactive elements. So there are games that you can put in there that give the students points. There are um, uh, quizzes. You can put a slide and then the next slide is a question based on that slide. So it kind of breaks it up. They're, they're not just watching or hearing you talk, they're having to do things along the process of the Nearpod presentation. And then the last thing is kind of more technical, I guess, um, or immersive. I've used virtual reality in um, my graduate classes. One thing that I missed, or sorry, that I liked in graduate school was the ability to meet in groups and have seminars discussing topics. Sometimes you can't get that in an online asynchronous environment. So we, um, selected graduate students and we sent them a MetaQuest VR headsets. And then we met four times throughout the semester um, in VR workrooms. There's, a, there's an app in Meta Horizon workrooms called Meta Horizon workrooms. And we met in that to ha have these virtual seminars. And then um, another vir VR app is called Spatial. That's where you can have students design essentially a gallery and then you can walk around that gallery in virtual reality. So I had a class project where their final projects were to produce campaign materials for a communications campaign, and they displayed their campaign materials in on the inside of uh, these gallery walls. And then we, in different locations, put on headsets and walked around the galleries and talked about their work with each other. So that was kind of a more uh, immersive, if you can get people online at the same time in headsets like vr tool yeah that's great it feels like it feels like you're kind of out on the um a little more the cutting edge of these kind of things like really interested in trying new things and seeing how it works as as people here listening are are maybe thinking about trying new things what do you think some of the maybe some of the downsides of technology are for engagement um, that people need to be wary of? Um, I think what I wrote as a, as a comment was the idea of technology as an assistant rather than a babysitter. And what I mean by that is, I think in any situation, there is a tendency to say, here's a thing that you can do, and I don't have to do anything with it anymore because I've given it to you. And so it could be, like a module, like here it is, we're giving you the module. You have a thing to do. I can now move on to my next task and leave you to do it. Um, as opposed to technology as this is the thing that's assisting us in interacting during this learning process. So um, I still have to give you feedback. I still have to have that connection with you as a student. Um, I'm not just going to have you take what I've created and then I'll walk away from it. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. We're just not putting in time, right. Just kind of watching them grow up. We're uh, actually leading them through this uh, process of learning. Right. So that's good. Yeah. I'm going to shift um, kind of a question around uh, teaching strategies here and ask Amy um, separate from kind of developing our courses or using technology, what kind of strategies do you find are really most helpful online with increasing engagement? 
Yes, I, I think my strategies are very video oriented, although each for each unit, the students watch my own videos, which in my own videos, I tell a lot of personal anecdotes about how, how I first learned the information. I talk about my childhood when I first encountered the sources. But sometimes if the subjects are more abstract, I also talk about how I first learned them. And I also express a lot of um, vulnerability or excitement in the in my lectures that the students enjoy listening to. Then they make written posts in response to my lectures and the reading and then everyone is required to make a video reply to one other student in the class where they're required to say something complimentary and I stress in many different ways that that's part of their grade is that they complement one another in their videos everything is also public everything until their final project which I encourage them to make public for extra credit so these video strategies which also involve the writing component both my videos to them and their videos in response to each other um, I feel like that there's a lot of engagement there because in part like Sally was saying I um in part as, as well to escape AI problems I want students to talk about their own personal lives to include photos of themselves as kids to involve YouTube clips that they like to involve clips of video games that they like, to involve social media examples, to involve podcasts, anything in their written discussion posts that they want to share, I encourage them absolutely to share. They know in doing so they'll receive positive feedback from other students in videos who say, that's fantastic, I just watched that YouTube clip, or I like the same TV show, and they know they're going to get positive responses, and so, and also from me. So I think that makes them more personally engaged, because they know whatever it is that they love, their own angle into what whatever the subject is, they know will be appreciated by other people. So that's, um, that's, that's an answer to begin with to, to respond to your question. Yeah, that's great. I have kind of a follow up. Um, what do you do with those students? Like in, in every class, it doesn't matter. It seems like whether it's online or face to face, you've got those students that are just going to tell you all those things, whether or not you ask, right? They're just out there. They're, they're just talking to you and those kind of things. Then you've got a, people in the middle that are just kind of waiting for an opportunity. It feels like, and when you're, when they're given the opportunity, a little bit of space, it doesn't take a lot of coaxing and then tend to have those students that it takes a little more to kind of pull, pull them into the conversation. Do you have any strategies, um, uh, about trying to help pull those students particularly into the into the strategy or those kind of middle to to reluctant students Yes. I mean, in my classes, there are topics where students know everything about them just based on what I teach. And so they can't wait to explain absolutely everything they know. They're the experts in the world on a topic. And I have other students who know absolutely nothing about the same topics. They've never seen a movie. They never read a book. They know nothing. And those mm -hmm. students go in much more terrified because they're afraid to say anything because they're afraid they'll, they'll be laughed at or made fun of, or they're just embarrassed about how little they know. So I make it very clear in my videos and just everywhere I can in the class that if they know absolutely nothing that's actually fascinating we can't wait to hear that because um the fact that they don't know anything is just another angle into the universe we're all trying to understand and so a lot of them thank me at the end of the semester for letting them say what they don't know and letting them feel comfortable in not knowing so in their posts and in their videos, they'll say, I'm actually embarrassed. I don't know anything, but they'll often explain why they don't know anything. And instead of getting negative feedback, they get really positive feedback back from students who say, actually, I didn't know anything either, or that's so exciting. You don't know anything. I'm ha fascinated by that. So, I mean, in my case, it's more just the difference between students who are consider themselves to be experts and the students who actually have uh, surprisingly, they've never even seen the source, the topic, the story, the information. They know nothing. And those students would be would be scared. So my goal as a teacher is to take away their fear and allow them to talk about their lack of knowing in a way that's celebratory rather than anything to be embarrassed about. Yeah, I love that. That's great. Um. I wanted to loop back, and I think I'll probably loop back to each one of you about this, um, but I wanted to loop back to Sally and just ask, in terms of engagement with students, um, and maybe similar to uh, kind of Amy, this approach, but do you have any success stories about drawing distance ed students into uh, into a course? Um, yeah, well, I, I I think I shared one right at the beginning where um, the student, you know, not an English major or writing major, but um, was taking my course. 
um, very much felt that the course was, um, was well worth it to him that, that uh, I assume him, um, I actually have no idea, uh, was, was well worth it. And, um, will carry on and take this with, uh, with this person, with this student. Um, another success story that I've had from specifically from the distance ed students is, um, that, I had one group, I, I do group the distance ed students all together um, so that they're all working with each other because most of them have really challenging schedules and understand that. Um, but they, uh, a couple of people from that group, when we had talked about the reason for starting the group work early and they said, um, yeah, you know, this is the first time I've talked with anybody else in my program. And, um, you know, and they were able to stay in touch and um, communicate and help each other uh, through through the group work and then through the peer reviews and, and, you know, sort of back and forth and they could talk about their jobs and um, other things. So it was uh, for me, that was nice to see that they were seeing that there are other people in the same position as as they are, that they could actually talk with. Uh, or communicate, maybe not talk synchronously, but communicate with other people who were going through some of the same um, things. And, I, you know, I hope would stay in touch and be able to talk about some of the classes they've had. Oh, have you tried this class yet? You know, you know, this was really great, or this class was really good. You all should take it next semester or something. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I've also had students um, from on campus say uh, that the sort of the traditional students who were taking an online class, um, you know, say that uh, they really communicated, they would ask them, they would ask each other questions um, about the content, you know, even if it wasn't during the group work, they were connecting outside of class, like the way you kind of would if, as you were walking out of class, if you had questions or had a study group or something. And then they said, what, uh, the one student in the group said, yeah, we would kind of talk about it. And if we couldn't come up with an answer, we'd like vote on who was going to approach you to ask <laughs> like we kind of felt embarrassed asking I was like well one you should never feel embarrassed approaching me to ask but um it, it to me that was um the, the, some of the good collaboration skills actually that were part of the learning outcome of that class um you know how how do you go to your manager if you're working in a group on a project you need to approach your manager but you also need to try and figure out some of the the um, stuff yourself and if you're a re remote worker how do you do that so um the the my my plan worked i guess is is um what i'm saying in in a few different instances and in a few different ways that's great yeah, in our minds, we're all very approachable, probably, mm -hmm. right? And I and I think that we are in different levels, but I think that um, in part because of that power differential that goes on that we don't recognize because we're not on the other end of it um, within the classroom. Sometimes I think it's really great for students to to have that strength in numbers to be able to um, to be able to connect in that way. That's great, Jamie. Do you have any? Um, success or failure stories too. We can learn a lot from failure stories too. Um, in your online classes that you that come to mind first? I think the the biggest success that I have noted in our online classes is I think there's a, a we have we have both an online Asian kind of degree program at the undergraduate and master's level. And because of that, we have a number of students who are, um, I guess, non-traditional or adult learners or or people that are in career in careers. And um, I guess the the biggest thing I see feedback from them is uh, really just glad that there's an opportunity for them to learn in their own time, and that professors understand also that they often have careers and family and you know if you, if you have careers and family how difficult it is to parse out time and so being cognizant of that in the way that I design uh, classes that are that, that, I, that I don't make it so complicated and time consuming that people who are trying to do this to get a degree while they have other things going on is too challenging I think to that note one kind of challenge you have is like the balance there 
so so I kind of increased my workload in in a some in a class because I didn't think that it was engaging enough. And then I did get a comment from someone that was in that position saying, "I don't know how somebody who has a family and a job can keep up with the work that is required with this." And so that was a thing. I guess a, a funny story I have. <laughs> with technology and teaching is uh, I did not know in one of my classes that our uh, students would set up a WhatsApp group for themselves to, to chat amongst each other and post-graduation one of the students I met at a conference said oh did you know did you know um about our WhatsApp group uh, I said I, di I didn't know about it he said oh look at the profile picture and so I I no longer have a Facebook page for other reasons not this but somehow they had gone back through my Facebook history and found a very old picture of when I used to go to music festivals and was perhaps a different person and uh, had put a picture of me at a music festival as their uh, WhatsApp group image. So that's just a lesson that uh, your internet history is out there and your yeah. students may look for it. Yeah. The chances of you getting Googled by your students is very high. But that's a great story. Yeah. <laughs> Amy, for you? Well, a, a couple of quick failure stories that are actually still inspiring are that I found that sometimes the technology we use that we start to feel is very natural, we use all the time. Sometimes students then suddenly don't understand how to use it. So that happened to me with the video reply format where it started appearing as links and I thought everyone knew and they didn't and couldn't see any video replies. And so I corrected that. But just this summer for the first time ever, I didn't find out until the course evaluations that the students, more than one, I don't know how many, didn't even actually understand how to watch Panopto videos. So they they thought they could only see my face and maybe the little PowerPoint in the corner and they couldn't see the PowerPoint. They were struggling and they thought that that was a problem with the class. So I was able to communicate with them, figure out that was the problem. That was after the class ended. But this time around, I put everywhere on the class, Panopto, this is how to view them. Before the first videos, I put it, I put it in their weekly overviews. I put it everywhere. That This is how everyone should use them. They thought that the Panopto was just for accessibility reasons for someone who did didn't have, they had no idea how Panopto worked. So I found that um, some of the um, failure stories are teaching experiences for me to learn how to teach differently next time. And it's just, just happened this semester. And then in terms of success stories, I'll just give you two quick ones. One is that I love it when a student decides what their career will be in the context of the class. So we were doing um, Sherlock Holmes in my children's literature class. And we were talking about how there was a lawsuit against Enola Holmes for the Sherlock estate. And it just came up in the class. And one of the students was so interested in that unit that she decided to become a lawyer and to go to law school, which is what she ended up doing and told the whole class that her, she, she got her idea for her career in that unit. Um, that's one success story. And just another version of a success story is when students will say, um, this is the class in my life when I was, again, kindergarten, third grade. These are two other examples I remember and this class. These are the times in my life where I felt the most inspired, the most connected to other people, the happiest. I've made the most connected with other students and it's changed my life the most and those moments um actually those are the moments that actually mean the most to me those personal moments where the student is saying i'm i'm happy and i feel connected to my peers and they're often students who like sally saying i mean sometimes they've come back after 30 years and they're in the same class with 18 year olds in all different disciplines so if i can achieve that kind of harmony where students are getting to know each other and feeling there for each other and inspired and wanting to go on and change the world together in an ecstatic sense and 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 happy about it that's where i feel like i've succeeded the most personally or not me it's really them i, I have to say it's the students themselves that are doing this work so it may be in making myself more and more invisible in these classes that i've had the most success of all if that makes any sense yeah it makes a lot of sense that's wonderful i love hearing that story and you know, it's a great reminder that it's it's possible um, to do both in line, online and in your class as well, but in face-to-face -face classes, but to really create those educational experiences that are inspiring and, and uh, life-changing for students as well. Um, thank you for that. Those are great. Um, I'm going to turn 
the attention. I could have other questions, but I want to see if there's anyone in the audience that has a question about um, what we're talking about here, something that came up. You could either unmute if you would like to ask your question, or you could put it in the chat. Or I didn't see any, but if, if Leanne sees any other questions in the in the chat that I missed um, that we want to direct. And feel free to direct it to one of our panelists if you want to, or just throw it out there for anybody. We haven't seen any so far, just the realization that we all want to delete our social media channels <laughs> now. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. Dale? Hey, uh, and this is pretty specifically for Jamie. Uh, I was super interested in the, the VR uh, idea in general and i'm curious about the the logistics of it and I, did everyone just happen to have their own uh metaquist or uh how did they how did they get their vr headsets so um our college has uh i don't know if they still do it but the year i applied they had an award it was an innovative teaching award you could put an, an idea in and originally my idea it was pre-pandemic was to bring industry experts into a class. I wanted students to have a face-to-face -face interaction with people that are in industry. And then the pandemic happened and that class went online and it shut down. And so I very quickly said, what if we use the money and bought, it, bought them head, VR headsets, bought the department of VR headsets and we'll ship them out to the students. And so we end up FedExing the headsets to their locations. And we gave a headset to two industry experts also, and I trained them how to use it. And then we held the seminars that would have been in person inside the Meta Horizon Workrooms app. So yeah, we, we bought the headsets for the department and then we would mail them to the students and they would, they would then uh, FedEx them back to us. Um, in, that, in, that, in that graduate class. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, it sounds really interesting. What are the questions we have? I think if there's no more, I have one other question that uh, either each one of you can answer. Or maybe there'd be somebody in the audience as well would want to answer this. I'm not sure. But when you are online, as was kind of mentioned before uh, with uh, Sally was talking about that great example of putting quizzes in the videos because you don't have that eye to eye contact with students to know um, kind of intuitively the engagement when you are online. What are some of your indications uh, that students are either engaged or they're disengaged? And maybe I'll ask our panelists first, but if anybody else wants to uh, jump in. Jamie, you have a answer for that one? So this is really tough because I think we've spoken about this before when in a, in a jumpstart pack session or something. The idea is really hard to, I give the example of videos. You know, you can go into Canvas and you can see how long everybody has watched a video for or how long they've spent on Canvas. But I think you, you pointed out that someone could pause a video and walk away from it and it would let you know that they're on screen for an hour, but they weren't actually watching the video for an hour. Mm -hmm. And so there's tricks that people can do use online and people that have been on online workplaces where they monitor if you're clicking your mouse or if you're logged into Slack will know exactly <laughs> how easy it is to bypass some of these uh, forced metrics of time on screen. So I think that is difficult. Like it, it's really kind of dis it's um, disappointing sometimes to, to see how few clicks your or watches your video has but as i said before students some have said to me well i downloaded the video and i watched it offline so 
what you see on your screen might not relate to how long I actually watched the video for. So that's an example. But I think the biggest thing in engagement is um, feedback, um, discussions, uh, and then kind of there's a learning assessments. Like, are, are they picking up on the knowledge is, is a, just a basic like assessment. But yeah, identifying whether or not students are actually engaged through online metrics is kind of difficult. I don't know if someone else might have a better answer. Jamie, I'll jump in and, and echo that because even with the embedded quizzes that I talked about, um, the students can walk away because the video stops at the question. They can walk away, come back, click, then let the video run, walk away, come back, click and answer. So, I, I mean, I don't really know um, other than a couple of a little bit of feedback from the students that I've gotten uh, that say, you know, hey, that really helps me focus. It, it, it helps me to know, you know, where the main points and the main ideas are, or, um, you know, maybe they just don't watch it until that question. And then it's like, okay, I know this is something I have to know. But, um, but in terms of assessing engagement, I mean, part of it is all is just, hey, are they actually taking the quizzes? Are they online? You know, are they missing things? And so, uh, you know, I'll go through at the beginning of the semester. Um, I stopped doing this part of the way through the semester unless a student who's been regularly submitting stuff suddenly drops off. But at the beginning of the semester, I send out those emails. Hey, I noticed you haven't submitted this. Um, are you okay? Are you connected? Do you know how to use Canvas and all of that? But, um, but so sort of checking in like that. But um, Amy made the point of um, that sometimes, you know, you become more invisible or as the teacher becomes more invisible. And I think that's one thing that I have found with online teaching is um, in a way it's, it's sort of humbling to me because sometimes the students, when the course is set up, they can move through it and they do their group work and they do everything and they do it well. And they maybe only contact me once or twice. Um, you know, they've contributed to everything. They're doing it well. They're doing fine. They get my feedback on it. And I'm like, but don't I matter? You know, don't you want to talk with me? Don't you want to email, you know? And they don't need to. They're doing fine. And they seem to be engaging. So that like one-on-one -on -one correspondence with me or the meeting with me or the, you know, asking a lot of questions, that's that's really not a good way to to um, evaluate it. And, and sometimes it is kind of humbling because they just are doing well and engaging with the material and getting their classwork done and learning the stuff. So um, it's, yeah, it, it's sometimes they don't need me to answer all their questions, which is a good thing, you know. Just to go on along with what Sally said, this has actually been students who have done the best ever, but they've often said at the end that what they liked the most and learned the most from was from each other. And um, meaning, that the class is set up so that they have the impression of learning the most from each other, but that's on purpose. I mean, this is what I mean by deleting oneself. Um, if the students are 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 with each other and feel connected to one another, learning the most from each other, that that's actually the environment I want them to feel like they have. So, um, in terms of engagement, for me, I try to put little surprising pieces of information in my lectures that are meant to surprise. And if they don't watch the lectures, they they can't really write the post because they generally have to in their posts say. I had no idea that was shocking or I, or else they have to say, I actually knew that surprise already, but I didn't know this or that or the other thing. So I can actually really tell if they're watching the lectures based on their responses to my lectures or responses then video to each other based on my 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 method of, of giving the lectures as I try to play around with surprise, surprising stories. Um, either, you know, it's a little, little difficult to explain and I know this varies by, by discipline. But that's one way I can kind of tell if they're if they've watched the video or haven't. It's very obvious to me from what they're writing in their in their posts. Online Easter eggs. I like that idea. Exactly. It is mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Yep. Those are great. And um, yeah, great ideas. And yeah. Um, 
it made me think of a couple of things. One, actually, our our session on Tuesday, which is our smaller group, all cop more of a discussion than a presentation, um, is going to be on from uh, talking about from sage on the stage to guide on the side, promoting active student learning for online. So this idea of of the shift that happens when you are really moving towards active learning, even away from this idea that everything's going to be lecture. Um, based uh, that I'm going to give all the knowledge to the student and bestow it upon them and they shall receive it the kind of idea versus um, creating a uh, community where students are learning from each other and from the content and creating that dyna dynamic uh, experience for learning in that in that community so I, I love that and I think that's a that's a good maybe note to end on as well as we're thinking about student engagement, that it's not all about us. It may be about um, uh, deleting oneself and allowing the students to rise up a little bit more in the in the classroom in order to really help them engage with both the content and each other and education um, in general. So 